Certain games make their way into the vast majority of households. <laughs> no, we're not doing that one. You see, when I was a kid, I remember looking at my mate's collection of games and pretty much always coming across this. California Games. What is it about this game that has fully stuck with the retro gaming scene? I mean, seriously, it's a bloody sports game, and it's far from the best sports game, and yet it has a surprising nostalgic flair about it that retro gamers just can't seem to shake off. Other sports games from the era don't seem to be as well remembered as this one, and in my opinion, it's because everybody bloody owned this game. This legendary little title got released on pretty much everything, and although the first time I ever played it was on the Master System, for better or worse, it was far from the first console to ever receive a port of this game. And with that in mind, it brings me great pleasure to say... Join me as we attempt to put our nostalgia at ease and understand California games and we're going to be looking at the game's history, the development, the humble origins and of course the games. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. His game is cheaper than a Beach Boy's greatest hits, and it's been re-released more times than that too. It's one of those lucky examples of a game that was incredibly popular and as of the time of making this video, still holds a very reasonable 5 or £10 asking price on places like eBay, well for whatever version you want. Heck, you can even get the Commodore 64 version, yet again, on the Nintendo Wii Virtual Console. <laughs> That's just bonkers. But hold up, hold up guys, because overly obscure home computer ports onto Nintendo servers is very much the end of our story. And with that, I think we are in fact getting a little ahead of ourselves. So, let's go back to the beginning. You see, back in 1977, this guy, John Freeman, was invited to a Dungeons & Dragons group hosted by a couple of eventual industry legends known as Jim Connolly and Jeff Johnson. And they all hit it off rather nicely. John was very much involved in gaming publications, having written several articles for Games Magazine, a book, and at this point was even writing an updated version of the Playboy Winner's Guides to Board Games. Anyway, Jim went out, got himself a Commodore pet to keep track of his Dungeons & Dragons data sheets and in an attempt to write off his tax purposes, he decided to team up with John, who he met at that Dungeons & Dragons event and is now a good friend, to basically create a video game. The plan was to change up the datasheet formula that they've already been using and turn it into a science fiction-esque war game. And only four months later, Starfleet Orion was created in December of 1978 by a brand new company, Automated Simulations. The game, although incredibly basic, was moderately successful, and with that, several other popular games were also made, including Temple of Ampsi, which if you didn't know, was considered as the first ever graphical role-playing game made for a home computer, and for its time, it again was a huge hit, selling over 20,000 copies within its first couple of years on the market, which obviously spawned several other sequels and plenty of add-ons. However, the real reason I bring all of this up in probably the only sports related complete history that I'll ever do until I get to Virtua Tennis is that for this new role playing game, Automated Simulations decided to create a sub brand name for the company and that name was Epix. The catalogue of Epix games really did start to grow from here on out with some excellent experimental projects such as Alien Garden which was one of the first art games ever released where you fly an animal and experiment by seeing what happens when you touch plants. It's all very very odd. But, even though the company was doing well financially and it was growing at a decent rate too, 
problems started to appear behind the scenes. John was getting wound up that Jim refused to update his game engine from the basic era of gaming as it was known, and before long the two decided to part ways. Anyway, whilst those guys did what they needed to do separately, another guy, a bedroom coder by the name of Randy Glover, who was at a local pizza hut, was trying out a brand new arcade game that had recently taken over from Pac-Man called Donkey Kong. And, well, you guys know the rest of the story, don't you? If not, feel free to click the card above, as the whole story behind this was actually my most recent video. Anyway, the long and short of it is, after Randy got involved and dropped the big Jumpman bomb onto the world, Epix made the very wise decision to focus on a lot more action oriented video games rather than mostly keep with the slower paced role playing ones. And as you would expect, sporting titles soon followed. Which brings us to 1984's Summer Games. This was released on a multitude of different systems that helped push Epix's reputation up into being the 16th largest microcomputer software house in the world. It was a massive hit and most importantly for this episode, it was the first game in the um, games series. So let's take a look. As a youngster, and even as an adult 30 years later or so, you have to admit that intro is seriously awesome. There are several events on hand here, such as the obvious running and swimming, which obviously are very wiggle heavy, as you would expect. However, when you start to load up challenges like Pole Vault, which actually require you to perfectly drop your pole at the right time, and gymnastics, which requires even more trial and error, sure, they are easy once you know how to play them, but they do take time to master in this one. You are seriously going to need to play this game quite a bit. I personally didn't get the game straight away upon release, but instead I got this as part of the gold, silver, bronze set on my beloved Amstrad CPC. This set includes two of the game's sequels, and even though at like five or six, however old I was, I really was terrible at these games. I only really got better in my teen years when I picked it up again. I always found myself booting up these tapes, however, to look in amazement at the graphics and sound that honestly was pretty unique for the system. Saying that, this one, and obviously future games, looks good for whatever you decided to play them on is a huge understatement, and when you look at what is considered to be the main influence for the game, <laughs> you can see why. This is Sweat, the decathlon game for the Atari 2600, an unfinished prototype. Well, actually, there are three prototypes in this game. Sweat obviously looks stunning considering what system it's running on, and that's because it uses the Star Path Supercharger to increase the capabilities of the system. It wasn't very popular, sadly, but it was very impressive. Well, like I said, this game, although never seeing the light of day, in a completed state at least, did in fact not only influence the game series that we are talking about today, but to give it even more credit, it actually looked better than what Epix released on the Atari 2600. So yeah, this is Summer Games, released on a whole host of different systems with varying success, and it gained quite a few incredibly positive reviews. So much so that obviously a sequel just had to be made, and the obvious idea of Winter Games was thrown around but was ultimately pushed aside as the team quickly worked out that a game called Winter Games, as long as it met its production deadline, would actually be released in the summer, and therefore, Summer Games 2 was chosen instead. As you can see, a slight improvement was made over the original game's opening ceremony, and the games, well, the same for those too. There is a lot more of the precision-based games this time around, which is very welcome, meaning that you need to actually learn how to play these even more than you did originally. That's not a bad thing, and although some of them are obviously better than others, the controls have indeed been improved upon, which results in a far more enjoyable experience. 
If you were the Commodore 64 owner, you could actually combine both games into one, creating the ultimate summer games collection, which is a must for multiplayer nights in. And what else needs to be said? The games are mostly great, and the reviews for the time are incredible, getting such praise as the sports simulation to end all sports simulations from Zap, and my advice is simple, forget the rest, buy this package, you won't regret it, from Home Computing Weekly. Sure, by today, a standards it'll get knocked down a few but still you will be surprised at just how well this game holds up epics were happy with it and obviously that finally resulted in winter games it's safe to say that Epics knew what they was doing by this point, and yet again what we got here was another set of games that just like before did what they needed to do and they did it really really well you got go nuts wiggle games just like before, precise learning ones again just like before that really are quite tricky and best of all you got stuff like biathlon which is an awesome mix of it all. I seriously hadn't even heard of this sport beforehand and the awesome mechanics of making sure that you keep your heart rate steady is just so unique for its time. Out of the three games so far this has got to be my favourite. And with that, where do we go next? You've had summer games twice, you've had winter games, what's left? Well, the world, obviously. Yep, Epics went and shot themselves in the foot with a small bore rifle and basically did it all. And better still, they actually pushed it even further. Sure, you had Russia offering weightlifting, Japan offering sumo wrestling, and France offering slalom skiing, but out of all the sports available to them for the rest of the world, what did they decide to go with? Well, they decided to give us Germany's barrel jumping, Mexico's cliff diving, Canada's log rolling, America's bull riding, and Scotland's caber tossing. <laughs> yes, it's a little strange, but it's what helped make these epics games start to stand out more and more as they were released. They should have gotten a bit boring by this point because essentially they are all the same type of game, but thanks to the stunning look, feel and obscurity of some of the titles available, they continued to be huge sellers. And again, this game got great reviews. But I ask again. Where do you go from here? Like I said, Epic's just dropped a huge hit with the world games, and once you've done the world, what else is there to do? Well, thankfully it was Matthew Householder, one of the main guys working on the world series upon completion, who gave them their answer. He went for a walk with his wife in San Francisco one early Saturday morning of 1986 when a young skateboarder went whizzing past on Italy Avenue when his wife came up with the idea of a game with skateboarding in it. And <laughs> that's exactly what he did. Pushing the whole Californian skating theme to include such things as hacky sacks, surfing, frisbeeing, BMXing and skating, Rad Games as it was originally known soon became California Games. Even though all of the games were popular, this was the one that really did ooze the 90s. And because of that, it's very much become the game that most people remember. California Games, for better or worse, is a legendary game. Starting right here on the front cover. You see, this was probably the first game in the Epic series that actually had a big marketing push behind it. Sally didn't want to pay out for both Louie Louie and wipe out for the music, but they did for the first time offer things like giveaways and competitions as part of the game's promotion. They also attempted to make a few of the games inside more appealing to girls too, such as the flying disc and of course the skating where you actually play as a small girl. All of this is fairly common knowledge for fans of the series, but what isn't common knowledge to the fans was some of the more questionable phases that the game went through during development. You see, even though marketing and discussion groups very much gave the outline, it was the developers that took it upon themselves to spruce it up a bit, and they created a few variants to the original plan that didn't make the final game, some of which were just, I'm sure, fun to play in the office, and others... Well, who knows if they were actually ever meant to be released. Sex and violence. <laughs> As nerds, we created versions with naked girls and there was one where the roller skater left blood when she fell. The goal was to finish without scars. 
We spend far more time than usual on California games since marketing was spending so much more money on it. We were allowed to go crazy. <laughs> so yes, this is California games. Yeah, the controls are not as simple as they could have been. But overall, once you've learned the game, it's pretty much clear sailing. It was yet another popular game for Epix. In fact, it was their most popular game to date. And as each of these games got the studio more and more money, as you would expect, more and more people got hired to make more and more games games. And although we all may look back on these titles quite fondly, you've got to admit by this point we are already on games game number five. That's games game number five out of eight, by the way. And as you can already no doubt imagine, this isn't a good thing. And to explain this in further detail, I need to show off both the game's winter edition and the game's summer edition, which both came out the very next year and in the same year of each other, which was 1988 alongside the compilation game that I spoke about earlier, Gold, Silver and Bronze. Yet again, both these games do what the others did before, give you a good selection of sports and they all feel pretty good for the most part. However, for the first time in this series, perhaps because it had been three years since the originals hit, some of those games were repeated events. I mean, yes, there was newly designed and arguably looking better games here than they ever did before, but for me, the wow factor of what was on offer had just been lost. By this point, as we play our sixth and seventh release in just over five years, I'm starting to get bored. The reviews for the time were still excellent, of course, but no longer were you seeing perfect 10 out of 10s all round. Yes, 80s and 90s are still very respectable scores, but it was apparent that the series was very slowly starting to decline. Well, it was very simple. It was because of this little machine right here. Hey, Mr. Block, can I go to the bathroom? Two minutes. Introducing Lynx from Atari, a color video game you can get away with. Well, sometimes. The Atari Lynx. You see, some of the originators of the series that arguably made the game's games what they were known for had actually moved on to what looked like better and bigger things, working on the Atari Lynx. Working on a new handheld isn't the problem though, it was the sheer success of the games games and whilst the true peeps did something new and exciting, Epic saw no issue in just getting more talented guys in, sitting them down and making them churn out more games games. And if you ask me, this coupled with the sheer oversaturation of the games games were the real reason for the slow decline. But. That's not all. By this point in the late 80s, not only was the latest two games not really bringing in the sales that they wanted compared to the incredible California games, Epics were also quite a stubborn company it seems, as they refused to begin developing for the NES. Put all of this together with the eventual failure of the Atari Lynx and the claims that Atari themselves were holding back royalties for the company, Epics, it seems, only had one last thing that they could possibly do. They had one final go at making a games game, and this was it. California Games 2. A simple game that was all worked on and conceived over a few pints, apparently. I mean, come on, California Games 2, it was a no-brainer. According to Kevin Fury, one of the main programmers, it was the cute artist girl from Epix that actually was tasked with coming up with the events this time. I mean, seriously, that was what was actually said in a Retro Gamer interview. And with obvious time restraints and limited funding, the final game was, sadly, very average. Not bad, just very, very average. I mean, the games they came up with were not horrible, just not as fun as you would expect them to be. Fans across the world on a multitude of platforms were hoping that this would be the return to form for the series, but what they got was easily the worst in the game's game series. Perhaps what they should have done differently, well to be fair there's actually quite a lot Epic should have done differently, but regarding the games games, perhaps the turn down extreme thrill ride sports games game concept with cliff diving, bungee jumping, parasurfing and even a velcro man would have been a lot better. I mean don't get me wrong, they're still fun to have here in California games too and the style and the look of the California games was fully on point with this one. 
but sadly, it just wasn't that good. Not only are we all sick and tired of these games by this point, the game just couldn't do what the first five games managed to pull off several years earlier. Which brings us to the end of the California games and the rest of the game's games. Except it's not the end. If you're easily offended on how companies use sex to sell their products, you might not want to watch this next bit, guys. <laughs> We're here to prove just how exciting the new VCR California games really is. On the right, actual scenes from its real-life contests. The action is intense, with hundreds of events you play against your friends. On the left, Tammy. Let's let Brad decide which he prefers. There you have it. VCR California Games. The obvious choice. <laughs> yes. So that was an advert for VCR California Games. Basically a California Games board game. Your job is to race from the Californian coast to San Diego, but along the way, VCR segments pop up that involves you watching two-minute clips of California games-based games that either end well or badly. And that's literally it. The whole thing is chance from what I can tell. And for those interested in watching the VHS, well, YouTube is your friend in this instance. <laughs> And there you have it guys, that is the complete history of California games and all of the other games games that are related to it. Sure there were plenty of re-releases of the original game as recently as the Wii Virtual Console and there was even some horrific looking remakes on mobile phones and the abysmal looking green light remake for PC, which as far as I can tell never actually got any further than this, thank god. But come on guys, this is why you're here. The original 8 games are all pretty much solid, besides that last release I suppose. And even though the events have individually had their ups and downs, none of them held the everlasting appeal that was the original California game. Hey there guys, thanks for checking out the video, I want to give a big special shout out to all of my Patreons, but first I want to give an extra big shout out to Player One Clothing, who are my new official sponsor for Slopes Game Room. Go and check out the website and like I said, don't forget to use the limited code SGR20 when you're at the checkout. And if you want to check out the game playing on the screen, then also do check the affiliate links below. But anyway, back to those Patreons with an extra big shout out going to... That retro video gamer, Gary Pinkett, Mantis, Ryan Burford, Andrew Dalton, Jonathan Haywood, Tomek Grabowski, Christopher Turnbull, Brent Craft, Ben Jackson, Phil Lowlands, Mr. Festech, Robertson Dunn, Lefty Intrigued Gaming, Abby Morris, Tim Labonte, Sobe Quang, DX, Tim Lunn, Genovi, Hananas, Pixels.Limited, aka Samuel Victor, Red the Beard, Conrad Constantine, Pretendo64, Creamy Elephant, James Loveridge, Casey Garner, Blitz Hedgy, Savage Gaming Show, Gemma and Mr. T's Shirts, Sir Right Away, Monster Fee, Finger Games, creators of Alien Scumbags, Mike H. Fell, Lucer Softail, Yield Hamburglar, Gregory Arden, Bew Wright, the conduit of still catching up on previous seasons, Ronnie Method, SSWB, Solix Captor, Jeremy Rodriguez, Nick Pollard, Bram Perez, Marcus King, Emocat, Tyndall, June, The Geeky Dad, Richard Carter, aka Fantastic Dizzy, Topple Float G, Petty Mew, Mark S. Hines, and Carl Watkins. If you wanted to get your name shouted out, come and see what I'm working on, come and see all of the other exclusive stuff that I like to share with these incredible patrons and to be part of my discord server which i am now an official partner of thank you very very much discordians then yeah check all those links below and please do click the link that you see on the screen but anyway guys this is dj slope signing out and hopefully i'll see you all next time